nothing really matters. No matter, no, no, no asset matters when you get to an NBA Finals court. Win or lose, once we get to June 6th and, and, and beyond, whether they win or lose, those trades, there's no revisionist history about a team that competed for a real championship. You know what I'm saying? This is not. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Kenny Beecham Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we finally, finally know. We've been watching basketball since, what, October to get to this moment. We're down to our final two teams, the Boston Celtics and the Dallas Mavericks. The Celtics secured their spot a little while ago. Tonight, we saw the Dallas Mavericks dominate the Minnesota Timberwolves on their home court behind Luka Doncic dropping 20 in the first quarter. I mean, if the one thing about Luka Doncic is when he decides that he wants to end the series, oh, he going to end the series. He going to blow you out. He going to talk to your fans. And then he's going to go on to the next level. And that, that's what he's doing today. Um, so it was just, it was a cool series. I wish that game number, what, five was more exciting and, and had more things to talk about. But the reality was Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic combined for 72 points. And the Minnesota Timberwolves side, well, you did get a decent Anthony Edwards game. You did get a decent Carthony Towns game. Didn't shoot the ball very well from three, but none of the others. Jaden McDaniels had five fouls with, what, uh, 22 minutes left in the game. And Rudy go, listen. Um, one thing about Rudy Gobert, and, and, and <laughs> again, it's coming from a Rudy Gobert fan here. Um, I never, ever, ever, ever want to see this man get the ball if it's not one decision to make, and that is to dunk the ball. Where in the first quarter, he had seven shot attempts. That should have been the moment of time we all looked at each other and said, let's get ready for June 6th, because we know what team it is that's actually going to get out there. Like, the way the NBA is going right now after game number four, there were people legitimately asking, like, could this series go to seven? Given the fact that the first two games ended with a game winner and then a three-point game, obviously the Minnesota Timberwolves can hang with the Dallas Mavericks. So the fact that they finally got one behind Anthony Edwards having his first really good game of the series and Carthony Towns having a really good second half, they were thinking, could this go se-? No, it can't go seven. Because Luka Don said it came. All I want from you is to leave a like on the episode. Subscribe to the channel, man. I, again, I can't believe it. That we are down to the last two. T- it feels like just yesterday we were talking about predictions. And it feels like just yesterday, Damian Lillard got traded. Didn't Drew Holiday get traded like two days before training camp? And now, he's going to be playing in the NBA Finals again. It just happened all so fast. Uh, leave a like, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend that we are all things basketball over here. We have Ask KB coming back for the first time in about a month or so because, well, like I mentioned, it's not a lot to talk about with this series. But I'm gonna, I want to talk bigger picture. If you want me to talk about specifically Game 5, Kenny For Real channel, I want these two channels to work in tandem, so go watch that. I kind of want to talk about this bigger picture with the Minnesota Timberwolves because, well, their season is, is over. Um, un- objectively, this was a, a successful season. Of my lifetime, I've been watching basketball since the beginning of the 2000s. I've only really seen one Minnesota Timberwolves team that were – Re- like really good. Like we saw the Jimmy Butler, Carthony Towns year and Wiggs year. They got to the playoffs, but we saw how that went. So in my life, I really got to see one Timberwolves team be good. And I was what? In 2003, how old was I? I was seven years old. So actually that don't even count. This is the first time of my life, really, that we see the Minnesota Timberwolves put together a competent, and not just competent, but a really, really good team. Now, the Wolves, for a lot of my life, have been one of those little brother teams that, like, yes, they exist, but nobody really cares. They make bad decisions. They got front office stuff going on. They have a bad owner and so on and so forth. But then they ended up winning the first overall pick in the 2020 draft. Is it 2020? 2020 draft, 2021 draft, whichever one it was. And they made the right decision because there was a time when they were shopping the pick, decided to keep it, and boom, Anthony Edwards comes in and kind of changed a lot of things. Because they won the lottery uh, um, with Carthony Towns, and we can't deny the fact that Carthony Towns is a phenomenal basketball player, but there's something about Carthony Towns that tells everybody that he's not necessarily going to be a 1A on a really good team. Well, they got that 1A guy in Anthony Edwards, and I know the conversation around Anthony Edwards has shifted so dramatically in just three weeks, but let's be real. Anthony Edwards had a phenomenal playoff run. I'm not going to like three to four to five... I'm not going to let a five games, <laughs> it'll be a five games, a five game stretch really deter me from the fact that Anthony Edwards is going to be a force in this league for a very, very long time. Um, and they have that guy. But the problem is now, when, when you think about it, they've done a really good job of building that team. Tim Connolly, everybody talks about the fact 
that he built the team to beat the Denver Nuggets. And now it's like he built the team to beat the Denver Nuggets, but didn't build the team to win a championship. I don't know how genuine that is, that, that much of that conversation. But the team is extremely, extremely expensive. And now, with this whole ownership thing, will it be Glenn Taylor? Will it be A-Rod and his group? We don't really know. That determines so much about this team's future. And I know Minnesota Timberwolves fans know this, but I'm talking to the other fan bases. Y'all don't really understand how important this management decision really, really is. Because if I remember correctly, Glenn Taylor's only went into luxury tax one time in the 20 plus years he's owned this team. This team is set up with a, a max contract from Anthony Edwards, a super max contract that Carnegie Towns is currently on. Uh, you had a max contract from Rudy Gobert, who's I think has two more years and then a player option. And you gave a max for Jaden McDaniels. You're, you're looking at four max players, right? And with the new CBA, and we're going to talk about this new CBA later in the episode as well, it dramatically hinders your ability to have this continuity if that continuity is four max players, three max players. Another team that's going to be going through this this offseason is the Denver Nuggets, a team that we thought might be building a dynasty. And now we're trying to figure out, will they be able to keep their, their core together? So this entire offseason, Wolves fans need to gear themselves up for a bunch, and I mean a bunch of trade ideas are going to be thrown around. A bunch, and I mean a bunch of rumors. Carnegie Towns ended up saving it a little bit, right? The last two games, he was good. When you go through that five-game stretch where you shoot 20-something percent from three as the greatest three-point shooter big of all time, makes me feel like you might not be safe in a lot of people's eyes. When you consider how, how much money this team is, is spending, you know you're not trading Anthony Edwards. You, you know you're not doing that. Rudy Gobert is the reason why you were well, not, not the sole reason. That feels that that's not that's not uh, uh, really nice to Anthony Edwards and then Mike Conley, old self, and Jaden McDaniels. As the anchor, he was the reason why you were the top defense in the regular season. So that's probably not going anywhere because the alternative is not very good defensively. Jaden McDaniels is one of the best perimeter defenders in basketball, even though Luka Doncic just made him look silly for a full five game series. I don't think he's going anywhere. So how do you get below that second apron? How do you get to where, whether it be Glenn Taylor or A-Rod or not paying the luxury tax? It's, it's one guy. And these were conversations that were happening before the season started. And unfortunately, it's going to happen again now that the season has ended. And I, I can't stress enough that whatever happens in this ownership is going to determine exactly what happens this offseason. There are rumors beforehand that one of the reasons why Glenn Taylor decided not to, to give the organization over to Alice Rodriguez and company is because he thought that Alice Rodriguez and them were tr going to try to shed salary. And Glenn Taylor is this, this is all of a sudden, he wants, to, he wants to be the guy to pay the luxury tax. I don't know what's true. I don't know what's not. But these are just the things that we heard um, throughout the season. So, again, one hell of a hell of a year. You beat the defending champions. You get to the conference finals, the furthest you have been in 20-plus seasons. A really successful year, but you went against a guy that, again, on last episode, we talked about him being one of the, the few players in basketball that you cannot scheme against. In game number five, I don't, again, I do not believe the Minnesota Timbers could have done anything for that first quarter avalanche. Three of the shots that he hit were close to 30 footers. I don't know what you do about that. You, you ask him to start his pick and roll early because that gives him so much time to get the ball out of his hands. You trap him at, at, the, at the half court line. The idea is to get the ball out of his hands. You, you, you get them to run an action early, you feel very good about that. And for him to just pull up at the logo and splash a three, what are you supposed to do? He hit two catch-and-shoot threes again. What are you supposed to do? I know somebody tweeted at me after I talked about it last episode. Kenny, uh, Luka Don's a 40% catch-and-shoot, three-point shoot. I'm aware that he's good at it. The volume is so very low that I don't even think about it happening often. But in this series, I remember off the top of my head, four different catch-and-shoot threes for Luka Doncic. Four different ones. So we're going into the NBA Finals. And the Dallas Mavericks, I, I just can't praise them enough for taking as many chances that they, as they really did these last season and a half. The Kyrie Irving trade, I know we look back on it and be like, man, finesse and Spencer Dinwiddie is Jordan Finney-Smith as a first-round pick and maybe even a swap. Finesse, finesse, finesse. But at the time, I want you to turn on your TVs. Go, go, go back and watch people talk about this trade when it happened. It had nothing to do with Kyrie Irving, the ball player. We know who Kyrie Irving, the ball player is. But it's like, hey, he got some off-the-court stuff that, that's a, a question mark, a yellow to red flag. 
He has not really been able to stay healthy most of his career. And you give up all of this? And now we look back on it and be like, brother, <laughs> that was all? <laughs> he just dropped 36 in the closeout game. That was all? And he had multiple streaks where he had a, a, a 10-0 streak by himself and then an 8-0 streak on another time. Got it for nothing. And then we get to this year. Um, first of all, again, we talked about the fact that they lost those last couple games of the season to get Derek Lively. I think there's a real legitimate conversation about Derek Lively being the third best player on this team, like the third most impactful, the third the most important player. Because I think you can probably say P.J. Watts is the third best, but it comes to import how important a player is, I think, I think Lively is really high on that list. So they lose those games to end up getting the perfect center for them, whether it be Tyson Chandler 2.0. I, again, my favorite thing about Derek Lively is his playmaking out of the short role. I've watched Tyson for the entirety of his career. Part of that here in Chicago when I was a shorty shorty, he was not passing like this. So maybe he's Tyson 2.0 with, with a pass, with a little bit of passing ability. And he also had another scary moment where he got hit today. Um, and then you get to this year's deadline. And I think when they made the trades, they were the eighth seed, seventh, eighth seed. And they made these trades. It's like PJ Washington. Day- you gave up. You gave up a first round pick for Daniel Gafford. You don't even know if Daniel Gafford's going to be starting. And I think early into his tenure with the Mavericks, he wasn't. So there's a lot, not criticism, but hesitancy for people to say that these were good trades because you mortgage all of the draft capital into 2030 in order to get what, two role players? And now here we are a few months out of that. That was back in, in February. And now those trades look amazing as well. Nothing really matters. No, 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 no asset matters when you get to an NBA Finals court. Win or lose, once we get to June 6th and, and, and beyond, whether they win or lose, those trades, there's no revisionist history about a team that competed for a real championship. You know what I'm saying? This is not. So whether you look at 2030 and, and now the Luka team is not as good and you give up the third overall pick, there's no revisionist history that say they shouldn't have made that trade. Because I got, no, I got no way to prove this, but based on the way basketball is in 2024, how, how it's been since 2019, 2018, or hell, we can go all the way back to 20, uh, 2011, when you have a superstar player and he spent seven years, eight years of your organization and never really compete for a championship. And again, I understand that a few years back they made a conference finals appearance, but let's be real. When you have that and a guy of Luca's caliber and you're not putting competencies around him, I think it's pretty easy to say that one day without a championship appearance that Luka Doncic might have walked into that office and said, I've seen enough. Now, now what I will say is that the European players, it doesn't seem like they're more likely to do the I want out type thing. But I think it's a conversation. Like there was an article written by BR before the season started or during the offseason. Again, not that BR articles are this, this, it's not the Holy Bible. It's, It's not this sacred, sacred thing. But there's an article. If, if, big if, if Luka Doncic requested a trade, here are the teams that would trade for him. That happened but right before this season started. And again, it's not based on anything. It's not them th- uh, saying that Luka Doncic did do this or that he was about to do this. But because of last year, the way last year ended, and Luka Doncic, he was pretty vocal about not being happy about not competing for a playoff. You know, Luka Doncic for his entire career has been like, I want to compete, I want to compete. This is before he even got to the league. So to have a, a, a year where they basically took it off, he was pretty pissed about that. So it got people to write articles about, okay, what's the next team? So I think without a finals appearance, there is a real legitimate world that a few years down the line, he might have been willing to ask for that next team. But now you got a finals appearance. And I'm telling you, I've never seen Luka Doncic smile as much as I saw him smile these last couple of games. <laughs> Specifically when the game was over and he was getting given the uh, Western Conference final MVP, whatever the hell they call it. I don't even know what they call it. He smiled a ton. And that's just great. Um, because it's, it's pretty easy for um, the, the star players to ask out, end up on one of the tempo teams that everybody knows these star players might be interested in going to. Luka Doncic could be one of those. It's very early to say, because again, he's only 25 years old. I repeat, he is only 25 years old. He's got probably a decade plus left in this association where he could be one of those dudes that's a one-team guy. And again, it might be crazy to say when you still got 10 years left, but a championship appearance means a lot. You see how well they took care of Dirk his entire way, where even the last couple of years of Dirk, he probably shouldn't have been out there, but they let him They let him rock because you are the greatest player in our franchise history. And Luka Doncic is on his way to taking that crown away from, from Dirk. Let's be real. Five, five All-NBA first-team appearances. That's more than Steph Curry has his entire career. He's got five at 25. He's on that path. 
So I'm excited about this. But let's let's I, I have until June 6th to really think about it. Um, from what I just looked up, these two teams, the Celtics and the Dallas Mavericks, have not seen each other post-trade deadline. So PJ Washington not there, Derek, I mean uh, uh Daniel Gafford not there, uh Xavier Tillman not there. You know, those things are very, very important. So there's no real film for me to go back and watch. But I'm I'm really excited about this because I think these are gonna be the best defensive teams that each of these teams have gone against. People forget that the Boston Celtics were the second best defense in basketball, only behind the Minnesota Timberwolves. And the way they defend is obviously completely different than what the Minnesota Timberwolves are. And when you think about the Celtics went against, it's Miami Heat, no Jimmy Butler and stuff. It's Cleveland Cavaliers, no Jared Allen, no Don Mitchell in a little bit. It's the Indiana Pacers, who are a better defensive team without uh, Halliburton. You saw that in his last two games, but not a good defensive team. Dallas Mavericks are one of the top five defenses post-trade that line. So both of these teams are, it's, I think it might be one of those grinded, grinded out series. And I think a grinded out game slash series definitely favors Dallas a little bit more. When you think about the Celtics being this team that gets up so many three point shots, so many three point shots, the idea of having a below 100 scoring game, and they have done that in the playoffs. I don't want to act like they haven't done that, but um, I think it favors the, the Dallas Mavericks if we have these super grinded out games. Uh, but if we going to go and we going to go, go, I think the Boston Celtics have enough to really hang offensively with what the Dallas Mavericks can keep up or get up. The one thing I don't think the Celtics have, at least right now, but before me really thinking about this series completely is if, if the game is close, let's say, let's say you're da- let's say the Celtics are down by five with four minutes ago, like they were in game number four versus the Indiana Pacers. I don't know based on what we've seen from the Dallas Mavericks' entire run, if a five-point lead with four minutes to go is something the Mavericks are going to give up many times. And again, the Celtics were able to come back against these lesser teams a few different times. They cannot, if they want to win the series, they could not, cannot play with their food the same way they did in these first couple. And we've already had this conversation. Were they playing down to the competition? Should we be worried about the fact that, I mean, they swept a team. I don't want to overlook that. But these teams were beat up and then... You know, some of those games are maybe closer than you would have wanted. I don't want to look at it that way, but I think there's a real world that that could be the the situation. I think that they're gonna have the bet the, the Dallas Mavericks have the best player in the series, but I think you can you can say that the Celtics will have the second best player, the third best player. That's Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. I think Kyrie Irving probably slides in the fourth best player. It's interchangeable between him and Jalen Brown. Who's third? Who's fourth? I guess that doesn't really matter. But after that. Between Drew Holiday, between Derek um, Derek White, and between Chris Asperzingis, who should be back, you could argue that the Celtics' depth is just a little bit much. But again, I think it will be a chess match between these two coaches. One thing I hated from the Celtics, and I think that benefits the Dallas Mavericks a lot because I think the Minnesota Timberwolves did this exact same thing late in these games. The Celtics have his tendency once it get, gets tough or when it's getting closer down the stretch. They start their offense so late in the clock and that you're playing right into Dallas's hands when you do that. Minnesota did a lot over the last couple of games. Not game number five because it was not a close game. But whether it be game number two and game number three, and it worked out for them in game number four, but they started their offense so late and I, the Celtics do the exact same thing. They do the exact same thing. I also think that the gap defense that you see that the, the Dallas Mavericks play, where they, they want the Jaden McDaniels of the world, or they want Kyle Anderson to shoot. Kyle Anderson took, what, four threes today? Oh, my God. They want these other players to shoot outside of Carl Anthony Towns. Well, they kind of let Cat shoot, too. But outside of Anthony Edwards, the Celtics, I mean, they're running five shooters. And maybe you say to yourself, Drew Holiday is notorious for having one good game to three bad games. Let him shoot. You just you might have to just reformulate some of that. Uh, I want to I want to go to these odds, right? If you go to FanDuel Sportsbook, you look at the NBA Finals MVP odds. Right now, Tatum is a minus one thirty. Doncic is a plus two hundred. Obviously, most people think that the Celtics or the betting odds think that the Celtics are the favorite in the series, and usually the MVP is gonna go to the best player on the best team. You do got eighty one, where Cedric Maxwell won it, um, but you also got the Eastern Conference Final. And that was Jalen Brown, who has a plus 600. And Kyrie Irving is sitting at a plus uh, 2,400. I think it is a best bet to pick Tatum or Doncic, depending on who you think is going to win that series. Um, but I, I, I'm not so mad at a sneaky plus 600 Jalen Brown after what we've seen from him in this entire, entire playoff run. 
The NBA playoffs have tipped off, but it's not too late for you to get in on the action with FanDuel. FanDuel is the only US sports book with over 5 million five-star reviews. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 winning bet. That's $150 to use on same game parlays, live bets, championship futures, and many more things. There's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Just go to FanDuel.com slash Kenny to get started. FanDuel, official partner of the NBA. Again, we got a lot of time to get to the NBA finals. We got until next Thursday, so let me really dive into it a little bit more. Next episode, we'll really, really give predictions and things that I like and things that I don't like for each individual team. I kind of want to get through some news across the association. And this one's probably not news for a lot of people, but this just blew my mind. This is from uh, Sham Sharanya. The Sacramento Kings have made a competitive offer to head coach Mike Brown on a contract extension. Three years and $21 million through 2026-2027, up to $27 million in bonuses, sources say. So far, no agreement. Brown is believed to be seeking around $10 million annually. I do not understand how the Kings just don't give this man the money. Y'all went 16, 15, 16 years without a playoff berth. <laughs> and, and the first coach, the first coach to get you there, has a they have a down year. Let's be real. They missed the playoffs completely, right? But I don't know if that's Mike Brown or the fact that this, this team thought that continuity was the best thing to happen when these other teams in the Western Conference are ramping up or coming back from injury. Mike Brown was not the reason why you missed the playoffs this year. You know what I'm saying? I think it was just the other people catching up to what you did in the first year. So the fact that you're not willing to give this man this extra, because again, it's 27 with bonuses. You don't have an extra $3 million to give the best coach you've had in 20 years be, behind, um, or maybe not behind, but in conversation with Jaeger, Jaeger was really good for them. And then, then they decided he wasn't the guy after a rough season. But it, it, I don't want the Sacramento Kings to go into this goddamn perpetual loop of mediocrity because they can't get their head out of their own ass. Mike Brown, bro, Mike Brown won coach of the year uh, last year. And if I'm not mistaken, there was not another head coach that got a first place vote. And you trying to tell me you don't think he's worth $10 million? I'll be honest with you. $10 million is a lot of money for a coach. But across the association, that's just the going rate for good coaches nowadays. Hell, that's the going rate for maybe not so good coaches if you ask the, 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 the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> so give the man the extra money. There's no salary cap on the coaching staff. Give the man the money, please. <laughs> it makes no sense to me. No sense. The first day of practice, he had a clip go viral of him and his stance teaching these boys how to hoop defensively. You don't want to give him an extra $3 million, bro. You playing hardball with the best coach you've seen since, since forever ago? It's just, it's, it's just a dumb way to run your organization. Now, I personally do believe they will cave in and give him this money because what's the alternative? You going to interview J.J. Redick too? You going to go get James Borrego? Just please give this man the money and let's let bygones be bygones because I know this is not sitting well with him or the players. Have we thought about that? These dudes that bought in to Mike Brown? Or you try to tell him that you might not bring him back because he wants three more million dollars. How do you think De'Aaron and Sabonis are going to respond to that? Give this man the money. Pay that man. The next one is more of a rumor from Windhorse. But y'all know Windhorse is pr pretty tapped into to Cleveland slash Ohio sports. Um, Donovan Mitchell's role with the Cavs organization ranks among the most powerful of any superstar in the league. What Donovan has with the Cavs is what LeBron has with the Lakers. In fact, it might even be stronger. <gasps> Whoa, um, I, I think we all recognize that there are certain players across basketball that are just going to have the final say on most things. No matter what the reports say, there's nobody in the world that can make me believe that LeBron James has nothing to do with this future coach of the LA Lakers coming up. You cannot convince me of that. I know what people are saying, but I've watched LeBron for 21 seasons now. I was here from the very, very beginning. I know the way he, he operates. You cannot convince me that you're interviewing these three coaches and LeBron doesn't have any say specifically because the, the guy that's first is his podcast mate. So when you say that Donovan Mitchell is here as well, now Donovan Mitchell is probably sitting, to, uh, and when it comes to ranking NBA players, he's probably somewhere between like 10 and 
17, you know, depending on who you ask. It's a lot. I mean, a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of power for a player that is that high on the list or that low on the list. But even with that said, I understand it. When you are Cleveland, you're one of these smaller markets. You're not one of the, I mean, hell, the Lakers, again, the Lakers have Braun and Braun is one making some of the decisions. And, and you have a guy of Diamond Mitchell's caliber, you have to do what you can to keep him around. You have to. Now, the only hope is that he is better at this than LeBron has been throughout his career. Because LeBron has made some questionable decisions as Ligia. You know, you hope that Donovan Mitchell is a little bit better at this. Um, but if this is true, it is maybe exciting for Cavs fans. I don't know. Because that makes you feel like, yes, Donovan Mitchell, you're resigning. Get that extension, baby. We good. But also, it could mean that he could be going out there to get all his homies. Um, Mikael Bridges, welcome to Cleveland. Uh, Darius Garland is probably going to be out regardless. I mean, he's going to be meeting with the Cavs if they decide to extend Donovan Mitchell anyway. But this is just a lot of power. And, and though I am so very pro player empowerment, I don't think this counts as that. It's, a, it's one of the scarier things. It's just one of the scarier things. Because from my experience with talking to NBA players, their perception of certain stuff is just different than what general consensus is or different than what front offices is, right? I mean, that's why you pay, you pay, who's it, Kobe Altman? Is Kobe Altman still over there? Um, that's why you pay people to make these decisions. Now, this could also just be saying that Donovan Mitchell gets to say yes or no to the trades, but Kobe Altman is still the one calling the team, whatever it might be. I hate taking the power out of the people that you pay to do that job. So I'm wishing them the best. You know, Donovan's my guy like this. Um, but yeah, why, why don't, we haven't seen a player coach in 40 years. Can we see a player GM coming up? Can we see that? Now, we see coaching GMs. It's been a while since we've seen that. Stan Van Gundy and Tom Thibodeau were some of the last ones I can remember off the top of my mind. But that gets you to the point where John Luer is getting a three-year, $27 million contract, or Todd Gibson is getting his 17th hundred year in the association. The player GM thing may be just a li little, bit, little bit too far. Before we get out of here, I've got my favorite segment is hashtag AskKB. All you got to do is go to the comment section, use the hashtag, go to Twitter, use the hashtag. Here's some of my questions. The first one comes from Isaac at Philly Isaac. Is it worth, worth it for the Sixers to give a max contract to older Jimmy Butler and older Paul George? I think it is. because And, and not because I think that Jimmy Butler is going to age so gracefully and that by the fourth year of that contract, he still is going to be great with the same thing with Paul George. But my question is, what is your alternative going into the 2024 NBA offseason? Right? I know you got three traded with first round picks, but you don't got any players other than three players on the roster. So you can say that maybe the idea is to use those three first round picks to trade for somebody that maybe fit the time. There's no time. Joel Abid is a timeline. Joel Abid is now, right? So if that means that this happens all the time in baseball, where a player would get an eight year contract worth a ton of money, but they not, they're not paying him to, to, to keep him under contract and keep him great for eight years. They're paying him for their first four, their first five, maybe that first six. And they're willing to eat those last two because that eight year contract was the only way that we can say that we're competing right now. And I think when we get to these older superstar, older all-stars and Paul George and, and Jimmy Butler, yes, it might cost you a max contract that might look bad in three years. You you should not be thinking about three years down the line when you have Joel Embiid right here, right now. You should not be thinking three years down the line when you have Tyrese Maxey right here, right now. So is it probably the smartest move financially? Probably not. But if you want to get a championship with Joel Embiid, you saw what happened in that last series. You saw that they could use a guy like Jimmy, a guy like Paul George. Hell, anybody that can create for himself. So it's worth it. Because trading for somebody in your cap space with just three first round picks, you're not getting the player that is of Paul George's caliber. Now, the Jimmy Butler trade is real iffy for me. I know the 76ers are monitoring him by all reports. I just don't know how you get there with just those three first round picks. It doesn't feel like Pat Riley's a guy that's going to go out there for draft capital. I mean, we've seen Pat Riley make some trades where he's not looking to bottom out, but instead he's looking to get people that can either help him stay competitive and then make that bigger trade later. That's basically what he did to get Jimmy Butler, right? Um, so those three tradable first round picks is probably not something that Pat Riley's extremely interested in. Now, if you're saying we'll route those three first round picks to another team and that other team gives us a player, then maybe Pat Riley's interested. 
But the Paul George one, I think it's a complete no-brainer. Is Paul George worth that, ma- that amount of money at this time? Probably not. But he is significantly better than Tobias Harris. And right now, it's what you need. It's right now, in my opinion, that's what you need. The next question comes from Matt Barnes. Not the Matt Barnes. Um, have you been keeping up with the WNBA? And if so, who are your favorite players right now? Absolutely. Now, I haven't gotten around to watching a ton of games live, but I have a real app, so I'm keeping up with scores a bunch, and I'll watch highlights after games. I'm a Chicago Sky fan, as you could probably imagine. Um, I got to watch them. Ju- I mean, I came I came to the to party a little bit late, right? I got to watch them a little bit on their championship run a few years back. Um and I actually got to meet Coach at the time. I met him in the elevator in a, randomly in Texas. And this was before I was really dive, dove, dove into the W. I'd known his face. I'd known his name and everything. Got on the elevator. I didn't know that they were in Dallas to play against, um, play, play against the Wings at that time. But I'm in the elevator, and I said, congratulations, uh, Coach, because uh, they were playing some great basketball at that point. And then they were sitting at our hotel, and I walk out, and Candace Parker's standing right there. And me, Candace, Candace grew up. 20 minutes away from where I went to high school or so. So I used to go to her neighborhood and, and there's a, a um, Raising Cane's restaurant where she's got a frame high school jersey and stuff. So it was cool. I said what's up to her. I told her that we kind of work kind of work together because at that point she was working with Turner and at that point I was working with Turner. She didn't really give a damn. Um, but yes, I am starting to, to watch the W a little bit more than it, well, m- way more than any other year. My favorite players, here. here's my top top five favorite players in the W. Number one is Enrique. And I know she's leading the league in scoring. Kenny, of course, you're going to pick the person that's leading the league in scoring. But I also worked with her on a show with Nike a couple months back. And she was just so very cool, so very down to earth. And she was telling me that she didn't do a bunch of TV, TV slash streaming stuff. So she was asking a bunch of questions and I was giving her my backstory and stuff. And she was she was talking or we were just having this full conversation about what we do. Um, and I had all obviously seen her on her little run. Uh, not little run. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but her run in college where she was phenomenal. Um, and now she plays in Dallas and she's great. Um, and she's an absolute bucket. Like I saw a tweet where people where someone was putting like an NBA comparison to W people. And honestly, that helped me a ton as somebody that didn't know a, a, a huge amount about the W and they said Kyrie Irving for her. And I then I watched it like, yeah, that makes sense. So that's my number one. My number two is Aja Wilson. No, no uh, explanation needed. She's phenomenal at every at everything. I met her once, and I'm 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 27 years old. So I'm using this word to to stay hip with y'all kids out there. That day, that day when I met Aja Wilson, I got to uh, chill with my boy Larry Marketing. I got to meet Jalen Brunson. Got to chill with Tyrese Halliburton. None of them had the aura of Aja Wilson. That's all I'll say. Aja Wilson was in and out. She was there for two minutes. She did her Instagram post and she dipped out. But it was cool to meet her. She's she's phenomenal um, and just really, really good. So that's my two. Um, it's, it's all of the people my favorite place because I met them maybe because Nafisa in Minnesota, phenomenal hooper as well. Did a, did a Also did a shoot with her. She was so very great. Um, and if I'm being honest, when we when I met her for the first time, I was completely unfamiliar with her and as completely like I didn't know who she was and then I of course with when my job I have to go do my research and that's when I start to find her highlights and all of her story and stuff um she was just coming back from maternity leave and stuff and she's a hooper and she's great um I, I gotta give love to these younger players too I gotta get Caitlin, Caitlin Clark in there I mean she's one of the main reasons why I started to attach myself to the, the women's game so she was just a gateway to get here and then that last player last player oh my last player might be Jewel Lo- Jewel Lloyd, um, because she's also just just a bucket. Next, we call some Joe. Is it harder to go from a really from really bad to a playoff team, or to go from a playoff contender to a legit finals contender? I don't think there's anything harder in basketball. When you talk about a team by team basis than becoming a real legitimate contender. Again, at the end of the day, only one team wins the season. Like we can we can say that it was a successful season for the Minnesota Timberwolves, but they didn't win this season. That's going to be between the Celtics or between the Dallas Mavericks. So I think that jump from a really good team to a contender to a to a, like a real championship contender is so hard. Not many people are able to do it. To go from a bad team to a playoff team, that's not easy either. But it's way easier to than taking that that other jump. I mean, you got to think about it. There are some teams that can do it strictly off the fact that they have a bunch of money and free agency and they sign some people. Now, it's somewhat of a rare thing, but that could just happen like that. But to get from a really good team to a contender, I mean, you need one of your players to be a superstar, right? 
you can be a playoff team with no star, no star, no real, real star. Like you got all star, but like no real, real star. You can make the playoffs and just be fine, you know. But to be a contender, to like a real legitimate contender, in most cases, in most cases, you need like a top ten player. And uh, you see how many people there are in the association, and you trying to say I need top ten. It's just less likely for that to be the case. Rocco, this is this is outside of hoops, y'all. Rocco as yeah, uh, you can only have one console and three games on a deserted island. What you choosing? No PC that's cheating. Which I hate it because I'm a PC gamer. I very rarely use my I have an Xbox and a PlayStation. I very rarely use any of those. So I don't really care which which console it is. PlayStation 5, I guess. Um I am taking. So this is my thought process. If I'm on a deserted island, I need a game. One of my games has to have so much content that I will never be able to beat it or close to never be able to beat it. And I think Red Dead 2 is one of those games. Um, and I haven't played Red Dead 2 just yet. I played Red Dead 1, still haven't played 2. And I know that the content in there is so large. You talk about the main quest, the side quest, and all the fun things you can do. I'm taking Red Dead 2. I need a game that's going to take me a long time to beat. I need a game that might take me 200 hours. So I'm bringing Elden Ring. I tried Elden Ring when it first dropped. I'm not a, a Souls type of gamer. I'm, I get frustrated very easily, but if I'm on a deserted island and this is all I got, this is all I got. So I'm, ta I'm taking Red Dead, Elden Ring, because that's just going to alleviate a lot of time. And as much as I hate this game, bro, as much as I hate this game, I'm taking 2K. Can you imagine how fun it really would be to have a real association that goes 80 years? You know, so I'm take I'm, those are my three games. It's again, I don't even like 2K, but it's a, it's the closest way for me to stay in touch with the thing I do love the most, which is basketball. So I will play the hell out of some of my career. I will get to a night on a deserted island. I could get to a 99 overall with no VC, no buying VC, just straight up playing my career games. I could also rebuild the Bulls to win 80 straight championships. Like there's a lot I could do, um, but I would prefer if I could like exchange one of these for the entire series of a TV show. Ooh, kid, is that fun? I'm, I'm getting rid of Elden Ring and give me the entire series of The Simpsons. Seasons 1 through season 34. I know they're not good anymore. I want all of them. So I would, I would trade one game for an entire series. My next question comes from Meeks. And this is our last one of the day. Um, Meeks asks, if the Celtics win it all, does this put Jason Tatum in top three conversations? Especially if y'all play Snooker. The answer is no. That is okay, though. The one, the one conversation about uh, uh, Jason Tatum, it's always so extreme. It's either he's the worst superstar in the league or he should be in conversations with these other dudes. And the reality is he's just not. Even if they win this championship, I think it's okay to say, even if he wins finals MVP, that he deserves to win this finals MVP. And he was phenomenal in the series. He's a phenomenal basketball player, but he's not top three. Even this one championship would not make me think that unless, unless this man averaged 50, <laughs> which is not happening. He's not going to be better than Yoke. He's not going to be better than Giannis. And he's not going to be better than Luka on this one playoff run. Again, he's great. He's top 10. Towards the bottom of the back of the top 10, but he's top 10. And that's okay. It's okay to not have him be top three. But also the people that are acting like this man is just this bum because he had a couple bad shooting nights early in the playoff run. It's disingenuous too, because I saw what he did against the Milwaukee Bucks with that 46 point game and game number six to force a seven. I saw what he did in the game seven when he had Joel Embiid on the island and dropped 50 of them things. You know what I'm saying? So it's okay that he's not top three. Y'all built this great team around him where he doesn't need to be top three to win a championship. And that's okay. Like, it's, it's cool. It's cool. It would just take a lot more for Jason Tatum to get to that level. That's all I'm saying. I appreciate y'all watching and listening to this episode of the Kenny Beaton Podcast. Again, we will be back before the NBA Finals start with some more in-depth analysis from yours truly. I'm super excited about it. We could potentially only have four more basketball games of the season. Like, I don't... No team is sweeping this series, right? Neither teams are getting swept, right? No, okay. But there's a world where we only got four more games left, so let's really cherish these four to seven games uh, because after that, well, we get to draft us as lottery teams. We're excited about that where we don't get real legitimate NBA level basketball that matters until the fall time. So let's let's cherish these last couple of weeks and I'll see y'all soon.